Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. This is Isaac Arthur, and instead of an interview by Ladin this week, he asked me to talk about some of the fallout future possibilities of mind augmentation. In a recent episode, I talk about the 50 and 100 year possibilities in the field of brain machine interfaces. Here is an excerpt from that episode. Throughout history, we've used our minds to build and improve things, but soon we will be able to build things that improve our minds. We've been trying to come up with ways to enhance the human mind for at least as long as humanity has had a concept for intelligence, and in all that time we haven't had a lot of success doing it. We have had no shortage of potions and concoctions meant to enhance the mind, and some, like coffee, at least partially work. We have no shortage of drugs that alter the mind either, yet for all that it has been a popular notion in fiction, even before we had science fiction, the science of it has eluded us. That is changing and becoming an emerging reality with technologies on the horizon and companies like Elon Musk Neuralink pushing to bring mind augmentation from fiction to fact. We have seen it more and more in science fiction too, with authors attempting to paint a portrait of what a future would be like where mind augmentation was common. My own favorite for this is the Revelation Space series by Alastair Reynolds. With the possible exception of Isaac Asimov, there is no author who has more heavily influenced me and this channel. Let's explore some of the boundaries of mind augmentation. We will begin with nootropic drugs. These are marketed as smart drugs or cognitive enhancers. Mostly these tend to be stimulants, but can also involve depressants or attention focusers. The general idea is to make use of a stimulant to increase mental arousal to increase performance. The trouble is that increasing arousal beyond a certain point actually decreases performance. The trick is to keep the mind in its highest performing state, basically the performance Goldilocks zone of the mind, by playing with the arousal levels. I mention this way to achieve mind augmentation because it exists today and it is estimated that sales of nootropic supplements exceeds $1 billion a year, so it is being taken seriously by many folks. The trouble is getting into the Goldilocks zone and staying there. Different tasks require different levels of arousal for optimal performance. Intellectually demanding tasks generally need a lower level of arousal, which helps with concentration. In contrast, tasks demanding staying power may be performed better with higher levels of arousal. We don't tend to have only one type of task in our day and moving into a different task can take you out of the Goldilocks zone. Another problem is that the drugs themselves take time to be processed by the body and reach the brain. Different drugs have different release rates and staying in the Goldilocks zone is more of an art form than a science. The final big elephant in the room is that there are side effects, some of the drugs can be habit forming or affect blood pressure, sexual function, sleep, and mood. There are many nootropic drugs and the effects, especially long term effects, of specific drugs alone and in combination is not well understood. Having said that, the nootropic group of drugs includes caffeine and nicotine, as you know I consider the coffee machine to be one of our best inventions. Nootropic drugs also include some outlawed or tightly controlled drugs like amphetamines. The use of nootropic drugs is controversial, and so is its status as a mind augmentation. Improving performance through the use of drugs might not actually be mind augmentation because all you have done is make use of the mind's own ability to perform by adjusting arousal. Beyond nootropic drugs, we enter a more murky world of future possibilities. These include neurosurgery, advanced education methods, and cybernetic implants. As to intelligent enhancement, we could have increases to general intelligence or a massive increase to one type, such as making someone a savant, maybe even an autistic savant, if that increase came by devoting other parts of the mind to assist. We might speed up how fast an individual thinks or give them implants that helped with some task or even network minds together if we develop a brain-machine interface with enough bandwidth. 
That last one, in its more extreme form, is called a hive mind, and we will look at it in a month or so, and it could be everything from a limited network, like a human community is, up to some connection so extreme that it replaces the individual components with a single new entity, in much the same way you and I are people, and our kidneys, livers, and stomachs are not. One of the methods to augment a mind is presumably hooking up to computers, directly interfaced into your head or just wirelessly interfacing with them. Such an augmentation could be so integral to you that you consider it part of your mind, or it might be clearly separate from your mind but still be part of you, same as your hands or eyes. Or it could be more separate yet, just a tool or a garment, like your shoes or a screwdriver. There's a fair number of examples of this in fiction, But I'm fond of the term E. Butler from Peter Hamilton's Commonwealth Saga, which is a fairly smart but not sentient computer assistant most folks have among their mental implants. It's clever enough to help with tons of tasks, so it is somewhere between a personal secretary and a smartphone, and it is in your head and it is customized to you. It could just as easily also be a separate entity entirely, an artificial intelligence. If I gave you a mental implant that allowed you to access the contents of an entire encyclopedia, most would say that was mind augmentation, but then again maybe not, as mere knowledge is not intelligence. We probably would consider it augmentation if it was integrated thoroughly enough into your brain that you could shuffle through the contents of it as casually as we can shuffle through our memories of some topical skill we have and allow us to apply that knowledge easily. Analogies between computers and brains are tricky, but are common because it's about our only option. Where a computer ends is hard to define. You could limit it just to the processor, but you can have more than one of those, or maybe just the stuff on the motherboard, or just inside the case, like the skull. The hard drive counts but then an external hard drive would not. What about the monitor and other peripherals like the keyboard and mouse? Our brain is a bit like that. The skull, like the computer case, is not an entirely arbitrary boundary, but is also not an ideal one, and the mind is even hazier than the brain. Sticking an implant in there isn't automatically making it part of your mind any more than if I stick a needle in there, and if we removed part of your brain and stuck it in some support system, connected by wires to the stuff still in your skull, we would say that's still your mind. Something like modifying our spinal cords to accelerate our reflexes through reflex conditioning or actively tapping into the motor neurons and internovans might be considered mind augmentation, even though our brain has nothing to do with it, or simply body modification. Again, where you draw the boundaries is a gray area. Obviously enhancing your memory would count as augmenting the mind, and if you record everything you experience with cameras and a decent indexing system, you can achieve fairly similar results. Again, there's a hazy boundary between a useful tool and an actual mental augmentation. As to memory enhancement, that comes in a lot of forms too. Better storage of course, a bigger hard drive as it were, faster recall, better search and indexing methods, higher resolution of those images or sounds or smells you remember, stronger association of various relevant memories, and so on. Thinking about the entire process of memory reminds us all of the various important aspects and components of it that exceed a simple recording of a video. It would be awesome to have a far better memory, one that lets someone ask you what kind of birthday cake you had for your 10th birthday and just be able to give the answer as quickly and casually as if they asked us when our birthday was. You could recall not just the information, but maybe even be able to relive the event like you were there. It would be potentially dangerous too. Not only could you get stuck dwelling on pleasant events of the past, but you could get stuck reliving traumatic or negative events. That raises the entire issue of removing bad memories, or implanting fake positive memories, another popular one in science fiction that we see in films like Total Recall and a proper memory of an event isn't just the video or audio component, it's the smells, the textures, the actual emotions going on. Such things tend to dim with time, but imagine if every time you saw a blue sedan, you remember vividly the time you crashed your blue sedan and were stuck in it for 20 agonizing minutes till the fireman cut you free. That would be awful. So would freshly remembering the loss of a grandparent, or a friend or a pet, like it happened yesterday. 
mind augmentations can come with some serious downsides, even ignoring the side effects they could have. A positive might come at the price of a negative, but sometimes having a new skill or talent can come with negatives. Learn a lot of science and some science fiction isn't as fun to watch anymore. Get better hearing and a street musician striking some off chords might grate on you like nails on a chalkboard, so that you might want to be able to dial down or switch off some augmentation. More importantly though, the brain is not a processor with carefully designed software. We talk about the architecture of the human mind like we do software architecture, but that's a dubious term. Your brain certainly has structure to it, but in the same way a forest or jungle does. Much like how an ecosystem can have massive changes from mild tweaks, the human mind and personality might be very sensitive to small changes. So early augmentation probably wants to avoid messing much with the architecture of our minds. You can go for non-mind augmentation, like just hijacking the optic nerve to send information through as a visual input and some others to serve as an output, both to other devices that do some work. You could go the neural lace route perhaps, something that does not alter thinking but pretty much is a net of detectors woven throughout the mind to read your thoughts, send that data for processing, and send it back as an input. Another option is to augment reflexes using the comparatively much simpler neural pathways in the spinal cord, or bypass the spinal cord completely as is currently being developed for people with spinal injuries. As to making someone smarter without messing with that architecture, two of the methods are just making it bigger or speeding it up. For the former, speeding it up, you could potentially replace all the slow signal transmission lines in the brain, which move anywhere from walking speed to bullet speed, with stuff that moves at the speed of light. We talked about that option more in the Transhumanism and Cyborg episodes, so I won't repeat it now. But this is what gets classified as speed intelligence, one of the three types of superintelligence identified by Nick Bostrom in his book Superintelligence. The other two types being networked intelligence, which we'll look at more in the Hive Minds episode, and quality intelligence, which is a hazy concept but basically the reason why you are better at many tasks than a room full of monkeys, even though they've got more combined brain matter than you do. Another author, my friend Dennis E. Taylor, calls accelerating thought speed frame jacking in his We Are Bob novels, and I like the term so I'll borrow it for the notion of speeding your thoughts up but not constantly, just as much as is needed at that time. This is essentially how fast you are experiencing time. Frame jacking would tend to drive you nuts if you were always existing at a time rate where seconds seem to take hours to pass. So while you might be comfortable running a bit faster than normal all the time, you probably won't want to speed up very fast for more than short periods. Also, by and large you'd expect everyone else to have this and for a new standard pace to develop. This is clearly beneficial too. Being able to crank people's brains up to run a million times faster obviously helps with scientific research a lot, and you have way less accidents if folks can respond almost instantly to them. But it would start messing with our concept of time a lot too. Someone tells you they were born in 1980 and another tells you they were born in 1987 and you know one is 7 years younger than the other person, but the fellow born in 1987 might have experienced a couple centuries of thought last year. These are the same kinds of issues we experience with relativistic travel, where time genuinely slows down for the traveler, or freezing people in sci-fi. You could have someone who went around on a spaceship that hugged the speed of light, so whole decades might pass during their journey while they only experienced a year or so, and they could be engaging in interstellar trade for centuries but only feel like they have been in the business for a few years, or they might accelerate their consciousness, frame jack, to experience the same amount of time as passed in the outside world, or even more of it. It's a neat trick for growing soldiers too. Sci-Fi loves to have tank-grown super soldiers you can pump out in months from some cloning vat, but tends to ignore that they aren't getting much training in that time. Fully grown or not, a two-month-old is a two-month-old, they aren't even talking and walking. If you can speed up their thoughts though, you can teach them faster, or just take regular people and hand them some books on the topic and tell them to read them now. Obviously it needs to be an electronic book, or better, some virtual simulation with hands-on training, 
but now they suddenly know the skill. Doesn't feel like it's them though because they did actually spend the time to learn it. You might expect everybody with this option would go and try to learn everything, but first off, most people do have plenty of free time and still don't hit the books to learn skills they don't particularly need at the moment. Second, this is one pathway to extreme life extension. You only live maybe a century of real time, but experience thousands of years of subjective time. And while we are keeping to a basic human mental architecture, even if we can extend their useful memory so their brain does not fill up or overwrite old memories, there's a cost to life. Firstly, you probably want to get paid more for an hour spent frame jacking than at a normal speed, since you are experiencing it, so our ideas about being paid by the hour changes. Living 20,000 subjective years when you are physically 20 might seem like a gradual change made to your mind over subjective years spent reading stuff while you sat down on a couch for a few minutes, but to everyone else it won't be the least bit gradual. Do you think if we stuck you in a slow time pocket for a century in a library to read, you would emerge the same person as far as your friends were concerned? All that new knowledge, probably even talking differently. How do you feel about the spouse you married and haven't really talked to from your perspective in a decade, and how do they feel about you? Understanding that, you might get very touchy about frame jacking a lot. So speed intelligence is a promising path to mind augmentation but not without its problems. The nicer path when you just want it for learning is to copy all the information over, but the brain, and anything functioning on a neural network concept, is not particularly suited to copy and paste. There's a big difference between photographing a book page and actually learning its contents, absorbing it and doing all the new wiring and indexing so you can recall and utilize it. The last aspect though returns to the continuity of identity issue. With something like speed intelligence you are just being changed gradually, from your own perspective, but suddenly spiking someone's intelligence up 20 IQ points probably changes them profoundly, and pumping them up to hundreds of times smarter than the normal person ought to change their psychology more than going from standard primate to human. A lot of people might not like that, even if they wanted to be that smart, because they might seriously doubt they were that smart, that we instead have an entirely new entity and they cease to exist. Folks also sometimes kick around the notion, usually in terms of the Fermi Paradox, that what we consider intelligence is sort of a form of insanity. We don't know that getting a bit smarter might not be a very bad thing. People worry about civilizations being too dumb to survive, or getting dumber and dying off, but getting smarter might get you too. You could potentially have a civilization fall apart simply because its members were so smart they were constantly being overwhelmed by existential crises. They might get depressed or conclude free will and existence were logically impossible or pointless, but were too smart to ignore it or rationalize a way around it, and just sit down and shut off. A popular notion is that civilizations run on a lot of stupidity and it would seem like if it were actually true, then one with a lot of mind augmentation might fall apart. Personally, I don't see it that way, but then if I didn't think making people smarter was almost always a good thing, I wouldn't spend so much time learning myself or teaching, so I might be biased. And education itself is the oldest method of mind augmentation and has a very good track record of performance. I think we will see mind augmentation of various types and levels start showing up in the next few decades and I would expect it to have positive effects overall. Another example of augmentation is just making the brain bigger, but keeping the same overall architecture. It has the downside of slowing things down, and we get an example of that from the House of Suns where the protagonist spends a decade talking to a human giant with a massive head who is incredibly smart but slow. It takes hours for them to send around all the mental signals between all those mini neurons which are far apart and formulate a simple thought, but it's not a very simple thought either. It has to go slow too, because every time you fire a neuron you generate heat and your radiating surface is not scaling up with volume and quantity. Double a skull's diameter and you get eight times the volume in neurons, but only four times the radiating surface. Now, 
we don't have a lot of technical details yet on how we can achieve mind augmentation, but whatever way we do that, that last point brings us to the familiar territory of having to deal with the laws of thermodynamics. We get an example of folks who have had cooling fins installed to help dissipate heat from thinking faster in another of Alistair Reynolds novels, you can see why I like him for this topic. When we talk about really speeding up intelligence a lot, that heat issue is a big one. Though come to think of it, restrictions on technology imposed by heat and thermodynamics is probably one of the most common obstacles I point out on this channel, probably because it gets ignored in science fiction so much. We do have supercomputers these days finally powerful enough that they process as fast as our estimates for the human mind, which is still several million times faster than your typical home computer. These things are gluttons for power, and every watt of energy they use has to emit as heat. Your brain uses and gives off heat on par with an energy saving light bulb, about 20 watts. A good supercomputer produces thousands of times more heat to do way less. Even overcoming the scaling issue and being able to create a computer that would fit into the skull alongside the brain would not solve the heat issue, and it gets worse. Recent research on thermal regulation of the brain has shown that a change in temperature of only a couple of degrees has a very detrimental effect on our ability to think. A mobile phone consumes about 5 watts of power. It is really dumb in comparison with a supercomputer, but even at that low power level, that's a quarter of our brain's usual heat output. We have to be very careful not to overstep our body's ability to dissipate that heat. This is interesting because while we can doubtless keep improving how much energy we need to spend per calculation, and thus decrease the heat we need to get rid of, it does indicate something about the speed intelligence approach. I mentioned earlier frame jacking in the We Are Bob novels. The higher your frame jack, the more heat you are going to produce and so the shorter a period of time you can do it if it is beyond your regular heat dissipation level. Whatever that is, even if your computer's or artificial brain is so efficient it can run a million times faster than a human brain constantly, you can presumably briefly push it higher than that. Not only is speed intelligence probably the easiest path to pursue for major mind augmentation, certainly conceptually the easiest to explain, but that these relative bursts of speed, frame jacking, would be a major aspect of that. One potential solution to the thermodynamics problem is to move the bulk of the processing outside of the skull. This could be moved to a chip embedded elsewhere in the body, or carried around on a pocket-sized computer, or even off-site, that you talk to over a network. This does raise the issue of communications outages where it is completely removed from the body and still imposes some limitations on heat dissipation when it is housed elsewhere on the body. Current performance gaming computer rigs and supercomputers have moved to liquid cooling solutions because heat can be removed from the hot areas of the computer much more easily than radiating or even convecting that heat away close to those hot areas. The human body is already set up to be a liquid cooled radiator of heat, and we could increase the flow of blood to the brain or other parts of the body and use other parts of our body to dump out the excess heat through sweating and opening the blood vessels under the skin. This means that mind augmentation could become a combination of brain and physiological augmentation where the two are inextricably linked. The more heat that can be dissipated by passing more blood through the skull and other implanted areas, the longer the person can be frame jacked and the faster they can think. Whatever system we ultimately adopt for mind augmentation, we'll need to address not only the interface with the mind, but also its physiological, social, and thermodynamic consequences. We have only touched on some of the concepts for mind augmentation and not a lot of the mechanics, those are still emerging and we are still novices when it comes to understanding brains, thought, and cognition. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.
hope you guys enjoyed that. If you want to learn more about futurism such as fast and light travel, space colonization, and space elevators, check out my YouTube channel, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, or subscribe to the podcast with the same name. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.